Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. My name's Danny. I'm an alcoholic. And, uh, you know what? I, I get very overwhelmed every time I'm asked to do anything for Alcoholics Anonymous. I, uh, I was at a meeting and, uh, I gave this brilliant talk. I, I, no. No, I did. It was like, wow. I, mean, I even impressed myself. And then I was talking to this newcomer, and he said, you know, the most important person in this meeting right now, to me, and I said, who? Who? He said, the greeter, the guy that greeted me at the door, he really made me feel at home. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been checking greeters lately, you know, see if they're on their job, you know. So, and, and I love it because you know the people that are like really understand this program. They're, they're not like talking to a girl saying, ah, uh, yeah, hi, I'm here. You're welcome. You know, they're not doing that. They're like, really, hey, hi, welcome. Oh, God, we're glad you're here. And, and, uh, you know, cause when I'm not dressed like this, I still look like a newcomer, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, 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 hey, we're, God, you just keep coming. Uh, I will, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, I honestly believe that that once you've fallen in love with this program, with this Alcoholics Anonymous, you're really falling in love with the whole concept and you need look anywhere else, you know, it's, and, and I don't mean, you know, like, cause I've been to like, you know, marriage counseling and I've been to anger management. I've been to, I, I, I they gave me anger management in San Quentin, so that should tell you something. You know. But, but, you know, all that stuff is great, but, I, I need search no more. I found, you know, you know, cause I believe in a higher power and my higher power got me here. So, uh, God, he got me here in 1959. You know what I mean? He was really, uh, knew that I was headed for trouble. And, uh, and, uh, and in 1968, uh, I, I, I got back, you know. I mean, that wasn't like the, you know, I, 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 I tried this thing a few times. I, I get a little upset when people talk about slips, you know, cause they talk about them like they're cute, you know, uh, I, I had a little slip on Thursday, <laughs> but, but thank God I made it for the Friday morning. I go, God, what a waste, you know. I had a slip in 1959. I got out in 1962. Another little slip in 62. Got out in 65. Had another little slip in 65. Got out the end of 69. So in, in 1968, while in prison, I, you know, this slip thing is not all it's cracked up to be here. You know, it's like... <laughs> And the, the, the worst thing in the world, the worst feeling in the world is a body full of booze and a mind full of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
because there is no longer peace. There's none. I don't care what you did. Who you, it doesn't matter. I don't care what kind of alcohol drinker you. There's just no peace because inevitably somebody, you know, drunk out of your mind, it's somebody's going to say, "Hey, easy does it." Oh. <laughs> and that's really the last thing you want to hear is those stupid cliches, you know. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, it's funny because uh, I, I met my sponsor in like 1962. I, I was in and he was out. And that was usually the case with me, you know. And I, I didn't, um, like I didn't believe this thing, you know, uh, because you're going to have to understand, you know, some of you got here, you know, like thinking that you were really hip, slick, and cool, you know. I got here knowing that I was really hip, slick, and cool, you know. And, uh, and, and I proved that over and over and over again in every penitentiary in the state of California, you know. Uh, and I remember the first uh, words... <laughs> That uh, my sponsor said to me, I was sitting in the joint and and I was I was Bonnaroo down. I mean, I was sharp. I was sharp. You know, it's God. I'm, the cre- I had I had creased pants, starched. I had creased shirt, starched. I had a T-shirt with a pleat and a a, a jacket. Starched. <laughs> My pleats were so sharp that if you got too close to me, they would cut you. you know, like, <laughs> and I, I walk out and I'm sitting, I'm standing in front of Harris, Johnny Harris, and, uh, and Johnny, and uh, and he was wearing this gorgeous suit, and uh, but you know, I mean, and he kind of said. Prison clothes don't impress me. And uh, I said, you know, what are you going to teach me? <laughs> and uh, he said it. He says, I'm going to give you some previews of coming attractions. He says, Danny, the only thing that's going to beat you to prison again are the headlights on the bus. <laughs> After that, I hated arriving at a penitentiary at night. Because they'd have the damn lights on. And when you're pulling up to San Quentin and the lights are on, and you remember the only thing that's going to beat you to prison are the headlights on the bus, you see the headlights. And you want to ask the driver, uh... Could you shut those off? You know? <laughs> you know. And I knew about this program. Do you understand? I knew about it. Everything. Every, it, when I got out of Penn in 1965, I, I took what was called a 30-day crash dive course. Uh, and that's kind of like you just learn everything there is to learn in 30 days, graduate, and you go to San Quentin. And... Uh, <laughs> But they said that in 1959, they told me that. In 1959, I busted into this meeting, and this guy said, Danny, if you leave this program, you will die, go insane, or go to jail. Now, notice how quiet the room got right there. See, that was that, woo, that, was that voodoo of Alcoholics Anonymous. You all heard the curse. The curse is if you leave this place, you will die, go insane, or go to jail. It is that simple. Now, you should have did what I should have did. When he whispered that curse, I should have went, I can't hear you. I didn't do it, and neither did you. See? So for all you new guys, if you leave, 
you're going to die, go insane, or go to jail. It's that simple. So anytime she breaks your heart, or he does, or or you can't pay the rent, or blah, 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 it goes right down the line, the alternative to sitting in here is dying, going insane, or going to jail. Now, i got to tell you something. In the 38 years that I have been clean and sober, nothing. I have. I never woke up in the morning going, hmm. You know, I, I think I'd like to go to jail today. You know, I, mean, I haven't. You know, I, mean, just, I don't. I don't care what's going. I don't care where. I don't care if I'm living in a box. It's not. Hmm. I, I might, I might want to die today. I haven't done it. I don't even deal with going crazy because you know a lot of us passed that a long time ago. I, mean, I, mean, try, you know. I, don't, I don't think we could get sane if we put everybody's brain together you know what i mean it's like uh, what a mess you know? but but so so getting here you know the, the, the last time I, I johnny said i was just getting ready to get out i was getting ready to get out of that joint and he said why don't you give yourself a break and join us. And that was the first time that anybody ever asked me to join anything. It was usually like, no, don't let him in. And <laughs> to join us. And, but I was getting out. So that means, you know, there's things I gotta do, you know, so, so I, I, uh, and I, and, and, you know, I still debating on whether I was an alcoholic or had a problem. Uh, I was getting out, so that meant I didn't have a problem. And, uh, <laughs> And I, I get out of this joint, and I remember we went down to, on, on, they got out and they went to the bus depot in Ontario, and there's a liquor store right there. And I, you know, naturally, come on, you know, sell, two short dogs. And, uh, I got these two little short dogs, and I'm driving back, and I'm, 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 I can remember being on the bus like this, and I'm looking at, at the penalty for alcohol in the, in the bus, and, uh, and I got, I got to Los Angeles kind of buzzing and I got out, that was a Saturday and I got home on Wednesday. <laughs> and my mom said the only thing different was that when I left I had stitches over this eye. When I got back I had stitches over this eye. It's the only difference. And, uh, that was 1965 and I started, uh, you know, I just went on, I just went on a, Bad little run. I ended up in, 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 in Alcoholics Anonymous again. See, and this thing, it's unbelievable. This program will follow you everywhere you go. I don't care where you go. They got meeting. It's, um, Vacaville, which is the state mental hospital for the criminally insane. Why in the hell would you have a meeting there? <laughs> But you're standing in that hallway trying to figure out, what am I doing here? I'm not crazy. <laughs> These guys are crazy. I'm not crazy. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous is now meeting in the dining hall. The Ross Mars group. I forget the name. Ross Mars. I mean, now me. And you're like, this is crazy. These guys are crazy. And they all know about it. Yeah, go, hey, hey. <laughs> it follows you, you know. And uh, in uh, 1968, there was a an incident on the on the prison yard in Soledad, and three of us went to the hole, and it wasn't nice. And I I remember saying. Uh, God, if you're there, uh, everything's going to be all right. Uh, if you're not, we're screwed. And, uh, <laughs> come on, boy. That was it. That was it. <laughs> and I, 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 I got out of the hole. I went to the hole in, 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 in uh, Cinco de Mayo. You know, of course, you know, it's like. But see, everybody doesn't realize. Everybody thinks Cinco de Mayo means. 5th of May. It actually, for a Mexican, it means get bail money. And, uh, <laughs> uh so, you know, we'll just, 
And because <laughs> because you're gonna go to jail. It's that simple. You you have to. You're you know if you're from the heart, Mexican. You know what I mean? So. Cinco de Mayo was a huge riot, and three of us went to the hole, and, and I stayed in the hole from May to August, and I got out in August, and I did a, uh, the rest of that year, and, and uh, I got out August 23rd, 1969, and I, I got, I got, I got, I got sober in August of 1968, and, uh, And it's kind of because I knew that this is it. I'm either going to die in prison. It was beautiful. I love that. That was good. I wish they'd show that at every meeting. Yeah. But it, it was like, I knew, okay, I'm either going to sit in this program or I'm going to die in prison. It's that simple. It's not no great revelation. Oh, I thought it wasn't. Are you going to die in prison or are you going to sit in these meetings? <laughs> oh, okay, I'll take the meetings. And uh, yeah. <laughs> that was a tough one. And so I started going to meetings. They let me out. And, and uh, I, I got out on a Saturday again for some reason. I got out August 23rd, 1969. And I had a year. And I was sitting... I came out of the, of the the bus depot, the Greyhound bus depot in San Fernando, and I'm standing there, and it was a beautiful August night, and I, I had on a, a, a tank top because I took off my "Please Don't Rain on Me" suit, and uh, and I'm standing there, I'm a little buffed up, I got that little prison buff, them beautiful new shiny tattoos, I'm standing there, and this beautiful little Coco Brown Chevy, 1953, boom, 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 boom. boom. And I hear this, Papacito! And I was, oh, that sounded like a girl. And, uh, and they made a U-turn and they stopped and they rolled down the window. And I got that wonderful aroma of perfume and marijuana. <laughs> oh. Oh. And they, <laughs> they asked me, do you want to go to a party? And, and, I'm looking in the back seat, and in the back seat there was this angel from heaven, and and her her dress was like up to about here, and her her hair was kind of twisted, you know. But the beautiful thing was, you know, when you take pills, your mouth gets well. She had a Lily F40 stuck right here, a pill. No, but wait, wait, think of this romantic picture. I think of it. I'm, this is West Side Story stuff right here. You know what I mean? I like, I, I could see myself going. Like, yeah, Maria, Maria in the background. Whoa, that's, that's him. And, and I'm, 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 I'm one. I'm not even a day out of prison. I'm a, I'm a nap. About a six hour bus ride from, from, uh, 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 Soledad, seven, I don't know, and I'm just, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm back. I know this, I'm back. It's all over. I'm back right here. Yes. And, uh, I yelled, no! And I ran back in the bus depot. <laughs> <laughs> and I call up. This guy that was busted with me, he got out first, and then he became, I think, president of AA. I don't know. He got out, and I, 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 I called him. I said, this guy named Frank Russo, Frank Russo, Frank Russo. And I say that because he told me never to mention his name. And, uh, <laughs> and I says, Frank, come get me. He says, where are you at? I said, I'm San Fernando. I'm at the bus depot. He says, okay, okay I'll, I'll be right there. And then he knew me, thank God, because I still had my eye on that Coco Brown Chevy. He goes, here, talk to my wife till I get there. And so all of a sudden I'm talking to his wife, you know, uh, I, I, you ever been in San Quentin? I, I don't know. Come on. You know, I couldn't ask her what she was wearing. I mean, it's my friend's wife. <laughs> what are you wearing? <laughs> so, so, 
So, I, I, you know, like he comes, picks me up, and, and he starts talking about meetings. He starts talking about meetings and this and we'll do. And I, I said, you know what, Frank, uh, take me over to my mom's. And, uh, and uh, my, uh, he says, okay, but you know, let, let's go to a meeting. Now, I, I, I want to relax. I just want to relax. And, and I, I walk into my, I, you know, I, did, I knocked on the door. I knocked on the door, and my mom came to the screen, and she said, Hi, Migo, we're so glad you're out. But she didn't unlock the screen. That's the one thing I've never forgotten. She didn't unlock the screen. I didn't get hugged. It just, and I stood there, and I said, Mom, uh, do you think I can stay here a couple of days? Uh, i got to find a, a, a place to stay. In and she says, let me see. And she turned around and asked my dad. And he was like right here, this whole conversation. He's watching television. And my mom says, Dan, Danny just got out and he wants to know if he can stay here a couple of days. And my dad said, tell him yes. Didn't say, yes, son, come on in. We love you and we miss you. He said, tell him yes. And then went back to watching, you know, the news or something, you know. And, uh, I came in and I, I, I walked directly to my room and I sat down and I'm sitting in my bed that I was in when I was 13 and I'm sitting there and I, I don't know about you guys, see, you know, some of you guys in my committee or you, know, I got a parole board that talks bad, to, <laughs> bad to me. And all of a sudden, they all were in session. All of them. They called like a full board. And that only comes out on special occasion. <clears throat> and they're telling me, what kind of punk am I? You badass arm robber. Look at you. Your dad won't even talk to you. What kind of crap is that? If I were you, I'd burn this house. <laughs> Knowing that my father didn't like tattoos, I took off my shirt. I got... And uh, I walked out the living room and I sat in front of the TV at this little, I don't know what you, you know, uh, footstool. I sat there and I looked at him and I said, I'm getting ready to say, hi, dad. And, uh, and just then my mom comes out and, and says, mijo, you want some cookies and milk? And <laughs> my guys didn't even talk. They were so embarrassed. You know, it's like, it's just like this is what it's come down to. Cookies and milk at mommy's. You know? And I, <laughs> I got up and I went to the phone and I called Frank and I didn't even get to say, come pick me. He says, I'm on my way. You know? <laughs> because he knew when we got in the car and I told him, Frank, take me to San Fernando. I'm a, I, there's a little Coco Brown Chevy. Said, well, let's go to this meeting first. Let's go to this meeting. And I know I can tell by the look of some of your face. Some of you are saying, well, you should have been grateful they let you stay. Here, you know, like, <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I, uh, I go to this meeting and this meeting was at the Allen Nest in Reseda. And I'm sitting there, and first of all, there wasn't a Mexican in the place. So I already hate it. And I'm sitting there, and I'm murdering everybody that got to the podium. Uh, anybody that got up, oh God, if he was in prison, we'd make a girl out of him. You know? <laughs> I'd kill him. Just killed everybody. There was arms and legs hanging all over this meeting. And uh, and then Frank kept telling me, it will get better. It will get better. You know, and, I, and I'm like, let's go to San Fernando, the Coco Brown Chevy. You know? <laughs> and at the end of the meeting, all of a sudden, and everybody like stood. It's not good to make sudden movements around somebody that just got out of prison. It's everybody just stood up, and I'm like, "Wow, what? You know, who got stabbed?" You know, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, somebody pulls on my my coat, my arm, and I look, and it's this gorgeous little girl. You know, and she says, "Give me your hand." I says, for what? And she says, the prayer, you know. I didn't even get a hug from my mom. 
real girl. And, and, <laughs> and then somebody else pulls on me. I look and say, it's a pretty little guy. You know? <laughs> Give me your hand. For what? I look over at Frank. I told you it will get better. <laughs> and I'll, We went to coffee, me, the girl, and Frank and a girl. We went to coffee, and we drove around all night and just went around. Hey, there's a meeting there, and hey. And uh, I got home about, about I don't know, 4.30 in the morning or something. You know, and in the morning, my mom came into my room. She wow, you're here. She was, like, surprised because I'd never done that. Do you, do you understand? I, I, when I got out... I just ran till I got arrested again. And I was actually in bed. And, uh, and I wasn't cut, bloody, nothing. You know? and, and, and wow, and I told her what, I went to this meeting and she's good, keep it inside. I just kept going to meetings. I kept going to meetings. That's all I did. I didn't, I thank God. I thank God that Frank Russo, Frank Russo, Frank Russo, I thank God that this guy, <laughs> This guy knew me a little bit, you know what I mean? Because I remember him saying, Danny, look, all you got to do is be honest. Uh, you know what? Never mind. Listen, all you got to do is be open-minded. Shine that up. Are you willing to try? I'm willing to try anything. Can we go to a lot of... We just went to meetings. We went to meetings, meetings, meetings. And this guy was so... We lived in, in Pacoima. You know, he lived in North Hollywood. I lived in Pacoima. But he would show up at my house something like, Hey, we're going to a meeting in Modesto. <laughs> and wow, all the way up to Modesto. And eight people in the meeting, including us, you know. And, and then we'd be on the way, all coming back. You know, we'd be on the way back, and we would stop by Soledad and throw rocks at, Yeah, we hate you, I'm out, oh! And we'd go, you know, hey, we're going to a meeting in Oakland. Stop saying, quit. Nah! And, and I threw rocks at every penitentiary I was in, you know. And uh, and at the same time, I was going to meetings, you know. It's like, and I went to meetings, meetings, meetings. That's right. I just went to meetings. I'd sit in meetings. And, and, and funny, because I, I used to have this. This get away from me or I'll kill you look. And uh, on the outside, yeah, I could really, I had it good. And, and I'd just sit there and just like, and people wouldn't come running up and, you know. And, uh, but on the inside, I was like, whoa, we're here. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> we're not there, we're here. You know, and uh, and I, I just, I, I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. Do you understand? I fell in love with it. And, uh, I remember trying to, I remember asking Frank about an inventory the first time. He said, Frank, what about that inventory? He said, it's in the book. So I don't know, he asked me about three days later, how about that inventory? I said, I don't know, no Mrs. Jones. So just like. Let's go to a meeting. I heard this guy talk. It was really funny because he kept saying, we're only as sick as our secrets. That's all he kept saying. We're only as sick as our secrets. Every time he said it, ooh, I think of another secret. Ooh. Ooh. And then I asked, what do you mean? He says, that's the inventory. You got to write that something. Oh. I know. I remember giving him my inventory, and I wrote it on the back of a gas bill. It wasn't even my gas bill. I just found it, and I wrote it. You know, it was about, I don't know, a bunch of secrets. I, I, out behind the nest one night, we used to, it's about 3 o'clock in the morning, because we, we used to go to, like, the late meeting, then the late, late meeting, then the Cal Worthington meeting. And, and we were like, Ooh. And, and it, we started a fire, and he was reading it. He read it. And, okay, you did that, Danny? I said, yeah. Did you like it? <laughs> Guess you did. You did it a couple more times.
So we're done with it. He gets it and he throws it in the fire. He throws it in the fire and then he's going like this. I'm thinking this is like some kind of ninja stuff from A. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm giving all this to God in the smoke. Whoa. That was like the heaviest ninja stuff I've ever heard in my life. For about 10 years, everybody that I sponsored, I... What you, I'm giving it to God in the smoke. I ran into Frank. I told him about it. He said, I just made that up, Holmes. I didn't know what <laughs> Really, we're supposed to do this little four-part thing. <laughs> we're only as sick as our secrets. I got rid of my secrets. And... uh Everybody talks about the freedom. I didn't feel free. I kind of watched Frank from then on, you know. <laughs> you ever tell on me, I'll kill you. you know? <laughs> and I just kept, be, they said this thing, everybody, of being of service, being of service, being of service. And I understood, you know, the only way that I could feel good is helping someone else. It's the only way I could feel good. I don't care how much I wrote. I don't care how much I prayed. There was always something missing. But it seemed like every time I gave somebody a ride to a meeting, you know, uh, I felt better. It seemed like, and because you got to understand, you know, when I first got here, I, I didn't even have a driver's license. You know, all I had was parole plans. And the police used to feel sorry if I had a... The first car I got was a lowered 1959 Chevy Impala. Baby blue with primer spots and Astro Supreme uh, uh, wheels. And it was this high off the ground. So I'm going to a meeting. <laughs> stereo blasting. Uh, and the, the police would boom, naturally. There's somebody begging to be stopped. And... Uh, <laughs> I'd get out of the car with no shirt, a tattoo this big, and a long, full-length leather coat. Perfect for hiding shotguns. And the police know that. And they would always go, all right, hold it right there. Open the coat. And, all right. And I, then we, where are you going? To an AA meeting. And they uh, see some ID. And you're going to have to understand the idiot that I was, okay? I hand this guy parole plans. <laughs> I got a full length leather, black leather coat, perfect for hiding a shotgun. No shirt with a tattoo this big on my chest. You are an idiot. <laughs> I got called an idiot, stupid, uh, other names, so many times. By the way. Here, I feel sorry for you. Get the hell out of here. You know? Never got a ticket. Didn't have a driver's license. I'm going to AA. Uh, I'm coming back from AA. You know? Five people in the car. The car is scraping the ground because <laughs> it's so low. Where you? We just came from the Allen Nest. Yeah. Never got a ticket. Uh, and I fell in love with being clean and being sober. Do you understand? I wake up. Wow, this is so cool. And, and in 19, I hate people that remember dates. <laughs> but August 22nd, 1969, the 22nd, I was getting ready to leave prison. And I'd given away all my worldly possessions. You know, I, I gave away my glass ashtray that I stole out of Warden Fitzharris' office as glass. <laughs> I gave away my piece of carpet, shag. 
I gave away my blankets that were brand new and said State of California on them. You know, they weren't worn. And uh, I gave away all my Bonnaroo's. I gave away, I gave away tailor-made clothes that were made for me. And and because I I did very well in prison. And I gave away uh, some uh, Romeos and some tailor-made boots, some special-made boots. You know. And I'm sitting there, and I said, I am getting out. And the thought hit me, why? Why do you want to leave? Why do you want to leave, go out, play that silly game with the parole officer, finally be broke, do a robbery, and then run? And so, but something else that Johnny said in 1962, he said, why don't you give yourself a break? And join us. And I heard it. I heard it again. And I said, that's what I'm going to do. So I started going to meetings. Meetings, 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 meetings. Service, service, service. And I think the way my higher power set this thing up for me, I don't know how I did it for you. you But he gives me a job every morning. He says, Danny, your job is to be happy, joyous, and free. I'll take care of the rest. And, uh, it seems like everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. Everything. I was trying to get my son, my, he was 15 at the time, I was trying to get him going crazy, trying to get him to meetings. He was 16. He was doing that, that math. And, uh, and I, come on, Gilbert, let's go to a meeting. Let's go, come on, let's go to a meeting. And, and, uh, and he would go, no, Dad, all you guys, all your friends have been to the joint. They're all killers. <laughs> I just smoke, man. Yeah, I just ate it. Lost. And uh, I was speaking in front of, like, you know, three, four hundred kids at a time, telling them about drugs and about alcohol, different schools. And... Uh, and one day I go out to talk and I just completely lost it. I couldn't do it. I said, what the hell am I doing here? And who the hell am I? I'm here. I'm going to talk to these kids. And they're liable to find my two dead behind a 7-Eleven. And I couldn't do it. I turned around and I started walking back. And Chispas, uh, one of the ex-leaders of the Mexican Mafia, who found God. Thank God he found God. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this guy was not a nice guy. But, but <laughs> and uh, he stopped me and said, what are you doing? I said, you know what, I can't do it. She said, but I can't do it. I'm done. I'm through. He says, wait a minute, what's wrong? I said, you know what, I'm here acting like I know something and my kids are dying. He said, well, why don't you practice that stuff you talk about, letting go and letting God. And I said, wow. It's a good thing he was in the mafia, ex-mafia, right? I socked him. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, but he's, no, 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 you just, you, you, you're supposed to, aren't you supposed to turn them over to God? And I went and I talked. That night I, I went to a meeting, I went to an NA meeting that night. And I'm sitting in this NA meeting. And I'm killing everybody again. After the meeting, this kid walks up to me. And this kid is bald headed, Mexican kid walks up. Hey, I want you to be my sponsor. <laughs> I look at this kid. This kid's got a, his eye is pierced. He's got a piercing through his eye. He's got a piercing through his nose. His tongue is pierced. His lip is pierced and he's got a little knife hanging down. <laughs> He's got both titties pierced. I'm thinking, I'll turn this kid into a Republican. <laughs> and I start taking this kid to meetings. You know, we start going to meetings, going to meetings, going to meetings every day and and. and one day I was, I was speaking up in Oxnard or Santa Barbara, so he stopped up at my house, and it's about 4.30 in the afternoon. My kid's just waking up. You know, he's like, he's been gone. 
are you going to a meeting, Dad? Oh, God, I want to kill this kid. And, uh, and, uh. and the reason he was there is because I got so angry at him one day, you know what I mean, that the old me came up, and I jumped up and I grabbed him. And what I heard out of my voice was my dad. <laughs> you understand? I heard my dad and my grandfather saying, I will break every bone in your body. Do you understand? And and I let him go and I walked outside and I just came back and I said, look, there's just no drugs in this house. I don't know nothing about no tough love. I don't, I don't know. Just no drugs in the bed. He said, all right. And so he just didn't bring drugs now. And then, I, I, I run upstairs to go take a shower and him and Johnny start talking. And then 20 minutes, my kid comes up, dad, oh, yeah. Hey, can I go to a meeting with Johnny? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. And they went to a meeting. My kid's got over five months right now. You know? Everything good that has ever happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. Everything. Do you understand? Everything. My daughter, I told she, I moved them two in with me. I just both of them. And my, I told my daughter, look, you got two rules. Don't die on me. And don't drink or use. And she's, I can live with that. And, uh, she's got over five months off that meth. You know, so. So this program won't only save your life, it can save your whole family's life. My sister has got seven years. One of my best friends just got out of the joint. He's got about, oh, he's going on a year. My brother's got three years. And you try to tell me this thing don't work, you see. I found what I was looking for in Alcoholics Anonymous. I need look no further. No, no, no. And I see people searching. I'm searching for a spiritual contact. Oh, why don't you pray? God answers me, male. Hey, that was pretty good. <laughs> knee mail. Do not email, knee mail. Do you understand? Get on your knees and pray. That's all there is to it. I'm, I'm, that's your spiritual contact. I love it. I love walking around the house in the morning mumbling a prayer and then watching my daughter walk around mumbling her prayer and, and then watch my son. Hey, stop mumbling so loud. You know? He mumbles his, you know. I live with my son and my daughter in Marina Del Rey. My son's in a band. It's his band, so that means every morning I wake up, there's at least four people laying on my floor. <laughs> and I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And if you're new, <clears throat> now listen up. You have to go to a lot of meetings. See, because they told me, go to meetings and don't drink in between meetings. Okay? Now, for an alcoholic, that's impossible if you're going to, like, one meeting a week. Hey, they ain't going to make it. See? They ain't going to make it. See? But, to give yourself better odds... Uh, where are you going after this meeting? Another meeting. <laughs> I did. Me and Frank Russo, Frank Russo, Frank Russo, when I first got out of the joint, hey, we used to go to like 16 meetings a week. That's all we did, meetings. And I, I, I had a lot of trouble at first, you know, and, and it's really funny because I remember I was over at the nest one time and these people came in and they said, hey, we're going on a move. 
Now, in Chicano, a move is a movida. And a movida means we're going to make some money. We're going to turn this and do that and make a little money. So, you want to go? Yeah. So, so, make a, a movida. We go. There's got about four pickup trucks. I'm thinking, shoo, these guys are heavy. You know? <laughs> Pull up in front of this house. Four pickup. I'm thinking, whoa, daylight, bro, cool. <laughs> they started moving stuff. I mean, a mo- really, we're like moving furniture. And I'm like, hey, what's up? I didn't understand this. What is going on here? And he says, we're on a move. We're moving this lady. And naturally being, you know, self-centered, selfish, and uh, stingy, I asked, uh, well, you know, what are they paying an hour? You know? No, no, come on. You know, I don't do nothing for free. And this guy laughed at me like, oh, what a joke, you know. And I said, I'm not being funny. How much we get an hour? You know? And then I said, well, you know, I found out we weren't getting paid. And then I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, are they at least going to, like, make us sandwiches? You know? <laughs> and this guy told me, Danny, if this lady could give us sandwiches, she'd feed her kids. I noticed when we moved the icebox, it had, like, baking soda in it and and cold water, I think. It's not much. You know, and, and, and then what's going on? And this guy tells me that this lady's husband picked up a beef and, you know, she's losing everything and somebody in the in the group is moving her into the guest house with her two kids. And we get back to the nest, and all these guys are like, hey, we were so cool, we were so cool. And I was bum kicked. <laughs> Didn't make nothing an hour. <laughs> Didn't get a sandwich. <laughs> and I went to Sam, this guy named Sam Hardy, and I said, Sam, what happened? What's wrong with me? And I'll never forget him. Sam always had that crap in his mind. Well, Danny, what's wrong with you? You're not a nice person. (laughs) And your problem is double, because you're not only not a nice person, you don't even look like a nice person. (laughs) You have never done anything for anybody and not expect some kind of reward. And he said it like that, reward. (laughs) If he had just said reward, like a normal person, I could have forgot it. But how in the hell are you going to forget reward? (laughs) And I said, what do I got to do? He says, you have to start doing things for other people and not expect any kind of reward. And I tried it. It didn't work. (laughs) Didn't. I was in Reseda Park. <laughs> I never shirt. You gotta remember, I got this tattoo. Reseda Park with no shirt, standing there. And this lady had a Doberman pincher and a boxer. And the Doby, the box, yeah, the Doby got away. And it was right here, I seen the leash. And I went, hey, Brock, do you want me to get this damn dog? And, I don't know how she did it, because she wasn't that big, but she picked up that boxer, ran by me, grabbed that doby, threw them both in her station way, and split. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> and I went and told Sam. And I knew he was going to tell me something like, well, you know, Danny, some women don't want a man's help. It's their ego. I knew he was going to say something like that. I walk in with no shirt and tell him what happened. He goes, well, look at you. You look like a damn maniac. I wouldn't want you touching my dogs either. (laughs) Why aren't 
why'd you wear the shirt? <laughs> what do I have to do? Now you have to start doing things for other people and not even let them know. I said, well, that's stupid. <laughs> now I can't even get thanked. Just... That's what I started doing. I started doing stuff, just doing things. Everything good that has ever happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. Everything. And I learned that. And I thank God for those people. And it's still working. In 1985, this kid called me up. And he said, it was actually the first phone call that I got from 1969 to 1985 that somebody was actually asking for help. He said, I... I feel like I'm going to get loaded. I've never gotten a call. My calls are like, hey, home. I slip. My calls are at like 10 to 2. You know, hey, I, 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 sl- I slip. You know, those are my calls. The first call I've ever gotten where somebody actually said, I feel like I'm going to get loaded. And it's like, wow, a real phone call. And I come on over. You know, we'll have coffee and stay up all night. And uh, he said, I can't, Danny. I'm working. Can you please come down here? And he said, it, and I, I'm a sucker. My daughter does the same thing. She'll ask me for something. She won't cry, but then she's the little twitching. Little, you know what I mean? Oh God! And I could hear it. He said, can, can, "Can you please come down here?" Oh, why me? I went down. I went down. I thought it was going to be like a regular twelve. I was going to wait out a side of his job in the parking lot. He was going to come out at twelve o'clock. It's eleven o'clock at night. He's going to come out at twelve at their break. We're going to sit out in the car, drink coffee, smoke cigarettes. Then he was going to go back in. Everybody was going to think we're gay. And then <laughs> it wasn't. I walked onto the movie set of a movie called Runaway Train with John Voight and Eric Roberts. And I walked, I thought it was the cutest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Because all these guys from like Brentwood and Westwood, they were all dressed like convicts. And they all had on like fake tattoos. Oh, it's, I'm sorry, it's smears. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> had tattoos all over the dress. This guy asked me, he says, this kid was a PA, production assistant. And, and this other guy asked me, hey, do you want to be in this movie? And I said, what do I got to do? He said, do you want to be an extra? I said, an extra what? (laughs) He says, can you act like a convict? (laughs) I'll give it a shot. (laughs) They give me those blue pants and I wear them well. I'm sorry. Uh, them blue state pants, you put them on me and it looks like they were tailor made. <laughs> they just fit. Perfect drape, everything. And then he gives me a shirt. So I took off my shirt. So the minute I took off my shirt, this guy comes over and says, Hey, you're Danny Trejo. I said, Yeah. He said, Danny, I saw you win the lightweight and the welterweight title up in San Quentin. I said, You're Eddie Bunker. I know you. He said, What are you doing here? I said, I'm hanging out with this kid. I'm a. Gonna... He says, do, do you want a job? I said, I got one. They're going to give me 50 bucks for acting like a ex, like a convict. <laughs> he says, no, no, I mean a real job. We need somebody to train one of the actors how to box. And I said, what's it pay? He says, 320 a day. I said, how bad do you want this guy beat up? Oh, <laughs> shit. Man, shit. <laughs> Sorry. I figured I'd beat him up, then write about it and tell Sam I was expecting a reward. <laughs> No, no, you got to be real careful. This actor's a little high strung, Danny. He might sock you. For $320, give him a stick. Are you crazy? Damn. I started training an actor named Eric Roberts how to box. And me and Eric got along. He was scared of me. And, uh, and 
And the director saw that, and, and all of a sudden, it's like, you be in movie. I, I, okay, what does that mean? Yeah? And it means that I just caught lightning in a bottle. All of a sudden. And this director, every night, because I would work with Eric, I'd keep Eric out of trouble. This director, every night he'd come over, you come tomorrow. And he'd kiss me on each cheek. <laughs> and then he'd say, you work with Eric. Okay, and then he'd leave, and I'd tell Eddie, okay, look, Eddie, he can have them two kisses for 320, but if it's going to go any further, we are going to have some I got everything, I got, I got insurance, I got union, I didn't even, I didn't even know what I had. They paid me, I worked for three weeks, they paid me. I got more money taken out of that check than I ever made in a robbery. I thought that they made a mistake, I folded, put it in my pocket, I'm gone. And he said, where are you going? I said, they made a mistake. No, they didn't, I made a lot of money. I was really blessed with that film industry because from 1985 to 1993, they made a whole bunch of prison movies. <laughs> I mean, get that Mexican with a big tattoo, I'm always there. And I had these wonderful lines like, we'll kill you. That was it, I'll go on. <laughs> I can do that. I said, this is a holdup. I said that more times in the movies than I ever did on the streets. Amazing. <laughs> I had this director say, Danny, you had this start off shotgun. I want you to kick in this door. There's 12 people there, and I want you to take them hostage. Now, I've told a couple of them to do certain things so it can really look real. So I did. I kicked in the door, and all right, and this lady yells something. So bang, I, I acted. I didn't hit her. I acted like I... I, I hit her and boom she went down this, I turned this shotgun on this guy and I said please please I haven't shot anybody all day and this guy goes the drink, cut cut oh where did you study <laughs> Dale's Market Piggly Wiggly uh, Bake America. Uh, it's, uh, a lot of a lot of drug dealers and <laughs> people come up to me <clears throat> and say, <I'm> "So lucky." <laughs> I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. That's all. That's all. I'm doing the same thing that I'm still doing. You call my house, you come over, we're going to have some coffee or we're going to go to a meeting. Doing the same thing. I need to look no further. Do you understand? I'm here. This is me. This is my life. God, it's like I promised my daughter. She didn't have a car. She you know what, sweetheart? You have a chauffeur. You never need a ride to a meeting. I, I'll, I'll always get a ride, get you a ride to a meeting. And it's wonder, it's so beautiful. 11 o'clock at night. Daddy, there's four of us here and our ride is leaving. So uh, can we finish our dinner and then will you come pick us up? <laughs> Remember your promise. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Because that's what I do. See? And my daughter just goes to meetings. And uh, it's so cute to see. I, mean, I got a sponsor. <laughs> I love this program. Do you understand? I am in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the feeling of, of hope. I love the feeling of hope for my family instead of despair. Do you understand? I love the feeling of just knowing that the sky is the limit. You know, if I would have gotten everything that I wanted when I first got here, I would have been done a long time ago. I wanted, God, what I want? I wanted a car and uh, to be off parole and a, a, a pad. That's about it. You know what I mean? 
That's, I mean, that was about it. You know, really? And uh, maybe, you know, some eggs over easy. That was about it. You know, was, and, and it's like all of a sudden, it's like, I can't explain my life. I am so scared sometimes that somebody is going to come by and go, Danny, wake up, wake up, let's go to chow. Oh, he wasn't, oh, shit. <laughs> I love this program. I, I love my sponsor. I love his sponsor. Uh, I, I heard these guys a long, long time ago. And the one thing that I got to say is that everything they said was true. You know, I mean, we could actually be fortune tellers for people that wanted to go out. You could come up to me. You could actually come up to me and say, I feel like drinking. Could you tell me what's going to happen? I could be wearing one of those salami hats and a big cape, and you could come up and I would go, Hamya, you're going to get a DUI. Wait, let me summon the rest of the alcoholic spirits. Oh, your family's going to disown you. You're going to be a dredge on the psyche right down the line. And when all that happened, you would be amazing. I should have listened to that salami. That guy really knew what he was talking about. Because it happens day after day after day for everybody that goes out. In 38 years, nobody has ever called me that went out with some good news. Ever. Nobody's ever been out two years and called me and said, Hey, Dan, life is beautiful. I, I, you know what? I just bought my kids Christmas presents. My wife adores me. Yeah, I can't keep her hands. You love me. <laughs> Nobody. I get those calls where people, and the first thing you hear is, <laughs> oh, things aren't that good, huh? If you're new, go to a lot of meetings. If you're new, go to a lot of meetings. And I say that because when you're new, that's, you, you, you don't hear that. What you just heard was, <laughs> go to a lot of meetings. And it says it. I have never seen anybody leave this program that was working it. Never. I have never seen anybody slip that was working this program. Ever. It's only the people that stop. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.